Tonight, trapped in Gaza as the crisis deepens and Israel warns of a long war ahead. A territory cut off and under siege, with Canadians among those desperate to get out. And uh, we are scared. Plus, we break down why Israel's war could soon spread. Exclusive new details about a Canadian woman brought back from Syria with ties to a notorious ISIS fighter. It is very frightening that someone like that has been welcomed back and repatriated into the country. You'll hear her in her own words tonight. And the push to change the conversation about menopause in the workplace. So when women should be earning the most, they're actually stepping back. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to travel to Israel on Wednesday. The U.S. Secretary of State confirmed that news late tonight while underscoring the need to get humanitarian aid to civilians trapped in Gaza without benefiting Hamas. The United States and Israel have agreed to develop a plan that will enable humanitarian aid from donor nations and multilateral organizations to reach civilians in Gaza and them alone. But the border between Gaza and Egypt remains closed. Aid trucks are lined up on the Egyptian side. On the other side, dual nationals gathered, desperate to escape. The crisis in Gaza is deepening, people scavenging for what little food, water and fuel remains, pulling the dead from the rubble left by relentless airstrikes. Hospitals overrun with the injured. In Gaza, a million people have been driven from their homes, many from the north, which Israel again warned should be evacuated. But the south is also a target, including in Rafa, at the border with Egypt, hit by an Israeli airstrike today. And the fears of a wider war continue to grow, both in the occupied West Bank and on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Several towns there evacuated as a precaution. All of this as Israel continues to target Hamas in retaliation for the militant group's brutal and bloody attack 10 days ago. Hamas continues to fire rockets from Gaza into Israel. Margaret Evans spent the day near the border and she starts us off tonight. Don't let the sky fool you. There is no peace in this land. In Sturot, less than a kilometer from Israel's border with Gaza, it looks like people left in a hurry. And those who survived a murderous rampage by Hamas militants did. Not even the police station was safe. This is what's left of the police station now. Hamas militants came into town on the back of a pickup truck. They took over the station and killed some 30 people inside, including police officers and civilians. It was a hard fought battle to get them out. The Israeli army wound up bulldozing the building with the militants inside. Most of the town has now been evacuated as Israel pounds Gaza from the sky and the sea and prepares its ground offensive. Israel has now increased the number of hostages it believes are being held by Hamas or other militant groups in Gaza to at least 200. On a solidarity visit to Israel, the former French Prime Minister Manuel Valls says Israel has a right to defend itself. The answer has to be strong and fair, he says. That's why a large part of the population of Gaza must be evacuated through humanitarian corridors. Diplomatic action is being taken to make it happen. Not soon enough for Gaza's dead. More the hundreds of thousands of civilians now corralled into southern Gaza after heeding Israel's warnings to flee for their lives. And there they still live under siege. The UN warning of a humanitarian catastrophe, food, water, electricity, all increasingly scarce. Unlike the anger and despair. Zakaria al is a Palestinian with residency in the US. They think it's not people here. These people here, these people here live. It's not life. Foreign nationals waited all day at the Rafah crossing, hoping their countries would negotiate an exit for them. But they were disappointed. No deal, 
and an Israeli strike. Wherever we go, there's shelling, crying, screaming and blood, says Hadil Abu Daoud. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, returned to Israel after days of shuttle diplomacy in the Arab world, fearful the conflict will escalate in the region. He met with the Israeli defense minister. This will be a long war. The price will be high, but we are going to win. At what final cost is yet to be known, but it is already writ large. And Margaret, Hamas has released a video they claim shows one of the hostages. That's right, Ian. It shows a young woman who identifies herself as Mia Shem. She says she's being taken care of, but that she wants to be returned to her family. We don't know when the video was taken or where, nor do we know what her actual condition is. What we do know is that the Israeli military has been in touch with her family for several days now, and that the family will be giving a press conference tomorrow. Margaret Evans reporting from Jerusalem. CBC News has now confirmed the identity of another Canadian killed during the attack by Hamas in Israel. 21-year-old Netta Epstein died at Kafar Azar Kibbutz. His family says he jumped on a grenade and saved his fiancée's life. He is the fifth Canadian confirmed killed in the attack. Non-essential staff at Canada's embassy in Tel Aviv have been directed to leave and have left within the last few days. But as Paul Hunter shows us, for many Canadians in the region, leaving is difficult and in some cases impossible. At the Gaza Strip's southern border crossing with Egypt, as desperation grows, the gates are still shut tight. Some 300 Canadians are among those still trapped in Gaza as Israeli airstrikes continue, retaliation to those horrific attacks by Hamas, efforts by Canada and others to negotiate a way out for foreign nationals have failed. One of them recorded this message with her family for CBC News. Uh, bombings are going uh, near, us, near us right now and uh, we are scared that any, 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 any minute, any second, a bomb could drop us next to, uh, next to us and then we'll be all collateral damage. We have no time to be safe. We need, to, we need Canadians to be moving. Meanwhile, success today for 21 Canadian nationals in a Canadian government-organized bus journey out of the occupied West Bank and into Jordan. More may follow. The West Bank is not under military fire, but tensions here are high, and dozens of Palestinians have been killed in clashes with armed settlers and Israeli troops. And there are fears that what's happening in Gaza could spread here. But by no means do all Palestinian Canadians want to leave. This is where I belong. Sasha, who asked that we not identify her for fear of Israeli reprisal, is Palestinian Canadian and spent much of her life in Ontario and B.C. She's against the killing of innocents, but worries the world only notices the plight of Palestinians when the region is in crisis. I'm against things calming down now, and I am fully fully in support of just things going insane to the, to the extreme. Even if, if it meant losing my own life, my family, anything, I'm willing to sacrifice in order to have this country uh, be in a better place for once. What happened with she, her? She, she was killed yesterday. Sabri Saidam with the Fatah party, which controls parts of the occupied West Bank, echoes some of Sasha's defiance. Dozens of his family members in Gaza have been killed in the past week. He knows Palestinians in Gaza are running for their lives, but worries if too many now flee there and in the West Bank, the Palestinian battle for nationhood could be lost. You're saying to, to Palestinian Canadians here, stay, don't leave, stay. I would say, you know, the matter of movement is a personal choice, but collectively I would say uh, Palestinians are Palestinians. Uh, they decide on their fate. I would say we all have to stay put. Uh, it is Paul, for those who do want to get out of either the West Bank or Gaza, what's the latest? Well, there's talk of another bus out of Ramallah soon. As for southern Gaza, foreign nationals are gathering near the Rafah border, but it's as if they're in a giant refugee camp, running out of food, running out of water, airstrikes all around them, and they're being told to fill out travel forms online with only sporadic power and sporadic internet access. 
We're told it is beyond frustrating. Paul Hunter in Jerusalem tonight. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is also calling for Hamas to release its hostages, noting three Canadians may be among them. Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people, nor their legitimate aspirations. They do not speak for Muslim or Arab communities. Trudeau also called for international law to be upheld and said he's working tirelessly to get Canadians out of Gaza. The stabbing death of a six-year-old Muslim boy near Chicago is being investigated as a hate crime linked to the Hamas-Israel conflict. We live in a country called the USA. We're not in war. And we're not bringing war here, too. The child's family spoke out today as a funeral was held for him. He died on the weekend, stabbed 26 times. Police allege his landlord attacked the boy and his Palestinian-American mother because they were Muslim. And he was angry about what was going on in the Middle East. The boy's mother survived but has been seriously hurt. Stunning new details are coming to light about a Canadian woman with ISIS ties recently returned from a Syrian detention camp. We can now tell you she was married to one of the most notorious ISIS fighters. And as Ashley Burke shows us, she's speaking out about it in a joint and exclusive interview with CBC News and the BBC. Dure Ahmed did everything she could to hide her face from the camera. She's facing a terrorism peace bond, the reasons why haven't been made public until now. What do you have to say about your time in Syria? <laughs> the Canadian government repatriated Ahmed and her children in April from this detention camp in northeastern Syria. If you want to charge me with something, then take me to court. I know I didn't do anything wrong. Now CBC News and the BBC have learned a lot more about Ahmed. That she married a British man in 2010 who went on to become known as one of the most notorious Islamic State militants. Part of a cell nicknamed the Beatles by their hostages because of their British accents. They were part of uh, a kind of fairly elaborate hostage taking scheme um, that kidnapped and tortured and imprisoned uh, Western uh, journalists and aid workers. Ahmed's husband was El Shafi El Sheikh. I don't believe in democracy. U.S. prosecutors say he's the highest ranking ISIS member they've tried. He's now serving multiple life sentences in an American prison, in part for his role in the executions of four American hostages James Foley, Kayla Mueller, Stephen Sotloff, and Peter Kassig. Certainly, I think she is prepared for charges. In an exclusive interview this week with this BBC journalist and CBC, Ahmed called traveling to Syria in 2014 a stupid decision and denied any knowledge of her husband's crimes. I can be charged tomorrow, I could be charged next week, next year, you know what I mean? Everything is still ongoing and it's not something that obviously Canada's priority and most countries' priority is public safety. You know, if I, if I was a threat or they found me an uh, imminent threat, I will. I won't be out. You know, I'll be. I'll be in. I'll be in jail, sitting in jail. An association representing Yazidis who sought safe haven in Canada after escaping ISIS captivity in Syria say they will be traumatized to learn Ahmed's here. It is very frightening that someone like that has been welcomed back and repatriated into the country. This national security expert says more charges are being laid against other repatriated women. It seems like once they've returned, the RCMP is building their case, potentially in conjunction with the uh, interviews of those women now that they're back in Canada and uh, seeking to prosecute them where they can. So, Ashley, what's the risk concern here? Well, Ahmed told CBC and BBC that her marriage ended in 2017, but prosecutors believe that the relationship continued and that during her eight years in Syria, she was steeped in ISIS ideology and that they have reasonable grounds to believe she could commit terrorism-related offences here in Canada, including indoctrinating and recruiting others to join ISIS. Ahmed's lawyer said there was no admission of criminal liability today, and the case is back in court later this week. Ian? Ashley Burke in our Toronto studio. That interview with Jure Ahmed is part of a new podcast from CBC News and BBC. It's called Bloodlines. It reveals much more about this story and the fall of the Islamic State. The first episode is out October 23rd. You can subscribe now on CBC Listen or anywhere you get podcasts.
Belgium has raised its terror alert to that country's highest level after a deadly shooting in Brussels. Authorities say two Swedish nationals were shot dead in the street by a gunman who got away. A claim of responsibility has been made online by someone who says they were inspired by ISIS. The shooting happened near a Belgium-Sweden soccer match, and 35,000 fans were kept inside for hours as a precaution. Canada's defence minister is calling a move by Chinese warplanes dangerous and reckless. Bill Blair's comments were in response to this. A Chinese plane at one point flying within five metres and firing flares near a Canadian surveillance plane. This happening above international waters in the East China Sea. Radio Canada was one of two news crews on board when it happened. The Canadian aircraft was there as part of a UN mission to enforce sanctions against North Korea. Turning to news back here at home, there are new guidelines out tonight for doctors to identify when a patient is drinking too much alcohol and how to treat it. And as Tashana Reed tells us, it comes with a warning about one commonly prescribed medication. It's no secret, experts say, Canada has a drinking problem and treatment is failing. 95 to 99 percent of Canadians do not get effective medications for the treatment of craving for alcohol or medications that can help prevent a relapse. Now, for the first time, guidelines for Canadian doctors on treating alcohol use disorder, which is the ongoing use or difficulty controlling drinking despite consequences. It includes a list of questions doctors should routinely be asking patients, like do you spend a lot of time drinking or recovering from drinking? And the most effective drug treatments for withdrawal or ongoing care, but also what to avoid. In some patients, we actually see a increase in alcohol use as a result of um, antidepressant medication. There's also a caution around prescribing antidepressants known as SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for alcohol use disorder. When mixed with alcohol, these medications may cause some people to drink even more. Most people don't necessarily think of alcohol as a drug in the sense of interacting with other drugs. That's what happened to Lynn. Her case highlighted in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Started drinking more, started drinking earlier. CBC News has agreed to not identify Lynn as she fears stigma around alcohol addiction could harm her business. During the pandemic, she was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. Her doctor prescribed an SSRI antidepressant, but she was also using alcohol. As I was increasing my dosage, I was also increasing my alcohol consumption. Lynn checked herself into a detox program and is nearly one year sober. Don't be scared to make that first step. Experts say they hope this new guidance will help doctors better identify people who need help and get them the care they need sooner. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. A new report is calling on Canadian employers to do more to help women coping with menopause. I was experiencing an in inability to focus or concentrate. I couldn't retain information. Why some companies are already making changes. Next. Plus, cricket makes its return to the Olympics. It's a sport that is being played across all of the Asia right now. Why some say it's such a smart business move. And a little later, from Fergus, Ontario, to a chateau in France. We were able to sell our place in, in Canada and, yeah, essentially buy this chateau. How soaring home prices in Canada helped a couple's dream come true. We're back in two. An election campaign is underway in the Northwest Territories. Voters will go to the polls on November 14th. The election was supposed to be this month, but was delayed by the wildfire evacuations. Ontario's government has introduced legislation to restore the land it removed from the protected greenbelt last year. That removal caused a huge outcry, and two damning reports found that the process favoured certain developers. Today's move comes days after the RCMP announced it's opened a criminal investigation into allegations about that process. A new report says there's a lack of workplace support for women during menopause and that some even wind up quitting their jobs. As Nisha Patel tells us, that's taking a toll not just on employees but on the economy too. 
When Darlene Mulcahy hit menopause, it was tough to work. I was experiencing an inability to focus or concentrate. I couldn't retain information. Her male manager told her he didn't know how to help. And I found myself feeling very alone and without any support at work. So um, eventually I had to take a leave of absence. Most women reach menopause between ages 45 and 55. That means two million women in Canada's workforce could be coping with symptoms. Many end up taking time off or quitting altogether, often at the height of their career. So when women should be earning the most, they're actually stepping back. There's a cost to that, three and a half billion dollars in missed work days, lower productivity and lost income, according to a new report by the Menopause Foundation of Canada. It's, it's like we're past our prime. Past President our Janet Coe is calling on businesses to be more menopause inclusive. We don't think this is a heavy lift for employers. We think that having conversation and breaking the taboo is one of the most important things that can be done. In a bid to attract and retain female employees, companies around the world like Adobe, Kellogg's and Bank of America are starting to offer menopause-specific supports. In Canada, Sun Life is one big employer taking up the cause. It's a solvable problem if we put some resources uh, and momentum behind it. The company is offering employee awareness sessions as well as benefit coverage for hormone replacement therapy, mental health supports and flexible work. It's going to help um, the career success, personal success, financial well-being, health well-being of, of our people. After time off and treatment, Mulcahy is back in the office where she launched her own menopause initiative. So that they don't have to feel like they're struggling to find uh, the information that they need. Hopeful that it will keep more women in the workforce. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. There is excitement tonight in the cricket world with the announcement that the game will be returning as an Olympic sport after more than a century. The proposal is approved. Uh, what it means for fans in India and beyond. Plus the danger of wider conflict in the Middle East. We are concerned. Uh, we see a real risk of escalation on the northern border. Looking at the battleground in Israel's north. Plus, what's behind all the labor unrest here in Canada? It's almost like there's a storm coming across the country. Why it seems to be having a moment. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Lacrosse is returning to the Olympics for the first time in more than 100 years. Canada's official national summer sport will be added to the 2028 Summer Games in Los Angeles in a six-on-six -six format. Baseball and softball are back too, so squash and flag football. But it's the return of another long-absent sport that's stealing the spotlight tonight. Cricket is also back in the Olympics after more than a century-long hiatus. CBC News South Asia correspondent Salima Shivji is in Mumbai where the announcement was made. The excitement is contagious at this World Cup cricket match, especially when the Indian team bus rolls up. The players on a hot streak. What an atmosphere here in Delhi. With hosts India dominating to the delight of their fans, here with one goal in mind celebrating for India. Cricket is known as a religion, right? We can't skip the opportunity not seeing the batsmen play. They will soon have a new opportunity to see cricket on the world stage, one of five sports added to the 2028 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. A decision made official in Mumbai. So the proposal is approved. This is the ultimate win-win-win for LA28, the IOC and the cricket community as cricket will be showcased on a global stage. For fans here, it's a no-brainer. The massively popular game has been absent from the world's biggest sporting stage since 1900. It's a sport that is being played across the, all of the Asia right now. You know how popular now it has become. So it is important to be the part of that because Olympic is Olympic. That is the mecca of sports. Yes, I believe there is a need for it. India will surely secure a gold. But this decision, of course, not only for the fans. It's a solid business move for the International Olympic Committee, angling for the huge market in South Asia and all of the revenue that will come from TV broadcasting rights with cricket in play. A big boost for the games and the sports image, especially if the stars show up. 
but not one that will necessarily attract new fans. Uh, I mean, we've seen it in other sports, say for example, baseball, softball in the past Olympic Games. They haven't really grown the game beyond the usual borders. Uh, so I doubt if cricket will achieve that target. Still, the borders are already wide for cricket, the second most popular sport in the world, soon back to Olympic heights. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. Time now for a closer look at the stories shaping our world. We'll show you why 2023 has become the year of the strike in Canada. But first, much of the world is keeping close watch tonight for what could be a deadly new complication in the Middle East. This is The Breakdown. Why Israel's war could suddenly get a lot bigger. We see a real risk of escalation on the northern border. Trading limited fire with a longtime foe in Lebanon. Hezbollah is the A-team. You can sense the panic in Lebanon, you can sense the panic in Israel. So what would it take for this front to blow up? Gaza gets most of the attention because a ground invasion by Israel is looking imminent in southern Israel. But the northern border may also be a powder keg. And here's Susan Ormiston to break down why. Ian, the biggest potential flashpoint in this war outside Gaza is that border to the north. The area is on a hair trigger. The border effectively separates two old foes, Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Israelis, and it's been hostile and armed for decades. Any miscalculation there could plunge Israel into a wider war which could redraw the fault lines across the Middle East. This view is from Lebanon on the horizon, Israel. And shelling and artillery across this border from both sides has been ramping up with every day. Friday, a journalist was killed on the Lebanese side. Days earlier, a Hezbollah fighter was buried, adding to the tensions. The Israeli military is waiting, reinforcing its side of the border. IDF soldiers have already been killed in the north. The casualties here are mounting. On both sides, people are fleeing their homes, worried that the war with Hamas in Gaza will spill over here, igniting a second front, a war between Israel and Hezbollah, the militant militia based in Lebanon. Hezbollah is the crown jewel of Iranian militias and proxy forces in the region. While very much a Lebanese group uh, with its representation in, in parliament, um, nonetheless, ideologically, uh, it is beholden to Iran. Just last May, Hezbollah launched war games, exercising its power. Canada has the militant group on its terrorism list. Estimates put Hezbollah's arsenal at 130,000 rockets. As significant as Hamas's military uh, prowess is, Hezbollah is, is the A-team, is the most powerful non-state military actor in the world. <laughs> their leader is on record in saying that everything they have, they owe to Iran, uh, the money, the training, the weapons. Uh, and so in many ways, Hezbollah's leadership and Iran's leadership are uh, completely intertwined. Soon after Hamas launched its brutal attack on Israel, Hezbollah announced its full-throated support. Sunday, Iran's foreign minister warned Israel to end its barrage on Gaza, saying, all options were being considered, raising the threat calculus in Washington. We are concerned. Uh, we see a real risk of escalation on the northern border. The U.S. is backing Israel to fight Hamas and Israel's enemies, sending now two aircraft carrier groups to the region as deterrence. To any country, any organization, anyone thinking of taking advantage of this situation, I have one word. Don't. Don't. But for the last week, the U.S. Secretary of State has been on an urgent dash across the Middle East trying to prevent an explosion into a regional war. Both sides are in a very uh, high alert mode, and you can, say, you can sense the panic. You can sense the panic in Lebanon, you can sense the panic in Israel. As ominous as all this sounds, 
Many analysts suggest at this point, neither Israel, nor Iran, nor Hezbollah wants to wage war, at least not yet. They are calculating the risks and the gains. For Iran, they managed to stop or freeze, at least for now, the Saudi-Israeli uh, deal. A deal brokered by the U.S. to normalize ties between Saudi Arabia and Israel, but which threatened Iran. They have shifted the uh, narrative. They have regained, definitely regained the resistance narrative that had been dying for so many years. For so many in this region, the rumblings of a wider war bring back vivid and painful recollections of the lead up to 2006, the last time Hezbollah and Israel were locked in war. This ugly new war has some similar hallmarks. Israeli hostages, escalating, pounding attacks, but in other ways, it is unprecedented. In 2006, Hezbollah sent thousands of rockets into Israel as far as Haifa. Israel bombed Beirut's airport and sent missiles into Hezbollah strongholds, plunging the whole of Lebanon into war. This is normally pretty congested in here. We were there, on both sides, covering the conflict. Trapped in the dark, in tear, in the south of Lebanon. Israelis have dropped some kind of troops in the area. <laughs> That war ground on for 34 days, causing massive damage and displacement. Lebanon still hasn't recovered. I think one thing we can learn from the 2006 war is that it reminded Hezbollah and Israel that they don't want an escalation. So far, he says attacks across the northern border are just within the unwritten rules of engagement which have been in place since 2006. But the risk of escalation is high. In 2006, there wasn't the context of this unprecedented level of hostility between Israel and Hamas. This creates its own set of red lines, which haven't been tested by 17 years of history uh, and have drawn in actors beyond Hezbollah and other regional actors, uh, which are watching the situation in Gaza incredibly closely. <laughs> What happens next with Israel's ground invasion in Gaza will ripple across this border and others, potentially pushing other militias in the Arab world to join the fight directly or by proxy. I think Hezbollah at that point, at this point, has chosen to dial up and dial down the pressure, depending on what actually is going on in, in, in Gaza. In Israel and in Lebanon, people are worried the next phase will inflame the region. I think uh, people are very nervous. Uh, people are quite tense. Also, I think people are very accepting of the fact that they don't really have any agency in whatever happens. There is agreement on one thing. There's no going back to normal. Susan, is what's happening on that border affecting the, the timing of the movement into Gaza? It's possible. I mean, every day Israel has been reinforcing its military power at that northern border, too, because the moment Israel invades Gaza could be the point as well when Hezbollah and Iran reveal whether they will act to broaden this war. All right, Susan, thank you. You're welcome. Coming up, why are so many workers in Canada walking off the job? Experience of the pandemic. Uh, has changed the way that people think about their relationship to work. We break down what's happening for workers and their employers. Next. Another week, another walkout in Canada's year of the strike. It's almost like there's a storm coming across the country. Demanding higher pay and hard times. It's so tough. Companies are also between a rock and a hard place. So who has the balance of power? Here's Anya Zolajowski to break down what's driving labor's unrest and how long it could last. Workers everywhere around the world are watching this. From the biggest stars in Hollywood to port workers in BC and school support workers in Halifax, thousands are reaching for picket signs. We're here at this strike in Toronto. It's one of many that have taken place across the country. And we want to find out why so many workers are walking off the job. Daniel Rodriguez has worked at Metro for 20 years. 
I'm just working all the time and I'm, it's, it's hard, right? Like, I break down, it's, I cry, like it's, it's, it's so tough. He's one of nearly 4,000 Metro workers who decided to pick it, shocking their employer and even their union. And they're not the only ones demanding more money, all while some employers are reporting record profits since the pandemic. Strikes are popping up across North America, and one of the most famous is in Hollywood. It's the SAG after strike. We caught up with Duncan Crabtree Ireland, the lead negotiator here at TIFF. With these creators, I think a common misconception is, you know, that they're all Hollywood celebrities. Can you speak to how broad your membership actually is? We have 160,000 members uh, all across the United States and actually Canada as well and around the world. Um, over 80% of those members make less than $26,000 US dollars uh, a year. Why now? Why was it this year that SAG-AFTRA ended up striking? This was a year where we were slated to have negotiations of our contract. But over the last couple of years, we've had extraordinary inflation. And so our members are working for a lot less now than they were than they were getting in real terms in 2020. And the companies want to continue that instead of bringing them along and making sure that people can you know, earn a living. Your fight is our fight. Many union agreements are up for renegotiation this year. That's creating a window for workers to make demands. But strikes mean a pay cut for workers. They're typically a last resort. We met up with McMaster Labor Studies professor Stephanie Ross to find out why workers seem emboldened right now. The experience of the pandemic uh, has changed the way that people think about their relationship to work. Um, I think that experience of sacrifice to contribute to keeping the economy going, to keeping public services going, um, and the burden that that's placed on people um, has really affected their consciousness. Turns out, labor action often follows crisis, and Canada is no exception. One of the country's most influential strikes happened shortly after World War I. 30,000 workers walked off the job during the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. At the time, wages were low, prices were high, while companies enjoyed record profit from the war. Plus, soldiers who fought wanted better conditions after their wartime sacrifices. It's since become clear typically strikes happen when there's economic hardship and the cost of living is too much to bear. This year isn't even the busiest in terms of strike action, even though it may seem like it. Now, we are seeing a moment where, you know, there's a relative labor shortage, where un un unemployment is low, inflation is high, and so people feel like, okay, now's the time to try to catch up against uh, all of the things that conspired to make us fall behind. Indeed, average rent across Canada is over $2,000. Interest rate hikes are squeezing budgets. Food prices have skyrocketed. And workers' wages are falling back. They're not able to put groceries on the table, not able to put gas in their cars. So workers are saying enough is enough. Mark Hancock is the president of QP. It's the largest public sector union in Canada, representing more than 700,000 workers in industries like aviation and healthcare. How do you respond to employers who say they can't necessarily afford to bring up wages or change work and work arrangements? That's not true. In 99% in of the places that we're bargaining, uh, we, we're seeing surpluses in many municipalities and provincial governments. There is enough money to pay workers what they're, what they're worth and what they need to continue to, to survive on. Mark says he's seen more strike action and more interest in unions. But for some, unions aren't always the answer. Most employers don't need a union to help them manage. They do management very well on their own. So, you know, not, not knocking unions per se, but they're not necessarily needed in most companies. John Hyde is a labor lawyer in Toronto who represents employers. Companies are also between a rock and a hard place because they have to plan for the future. So they have to determine what's going to go on, how the market's going to be changed, how interest rates are going to impact their products. And how do you respond to workers who are saying that they need more wages because of the cost of living, inflation, um, higher interest rates, etc.? Let's face it, they do. Okay, but there has to be a balance struck because you, you can't bankrupt the company either. However, across North America, union popularity is up. In the U.S., union support is at a 50-year high. 
Even President Biden joined a picket line. Now we have built the middle class. Yeah. That's a fact. Strikers, experts, and pollsters say it's up here in Canada too. It's almost like there's a storm coming across the country. To be honest, I see no end. I, I think workers are continuing to be frustrated. Uh, they're, they're experiencing uh, bosses and governments that don't seem to be caring about how they continue to live and support their families. So I see this going on for, for quite a period of time. When do we want it now? The companies, are, I think, are underappreciating the workers right now, right? Like I said before, we run this company. We're like the heart of the company. We're the backbone. We, every day we come into work, we give our 100%. We'd like to see a little bit back, right? Since we spoke with Daniel in the summer, he and his colleagues struck a deal, but the fate of other negotiations still hangs in the balance. Daniel looks at several industries. Let's zero in on the latest for Ontario car makers. 4,300 GM workers have a new three-year contract with some wages set to rise by 25% by the end of the deal. For some newer hires, the percentage increases could be even greater. All that after less than a day of picketing. Tonight, we want to say goodbye to our longtime colleague and very talented journalist, Diana Swain, as she moves on from CBC News after, hard to believe, a 33-year career. Good evening. I'm Diana Swain. Tonight, you know her best from her time in front of the camera, which included anchoring newscasts from Winnipeg to Toronto to... This is The National. She also hosted CBC News Network's The Investigator. There has never been anything like what unfolded these past weeks. That built on her years of award-winning investigative journalism, including groundbreaking work uncovering allegations of sexual abuse in Scouts Canada. For the last few years, Diana was also a driver of that work behind the scenes including as executive producer of The Fifth Estate. We wish her all the best for what comes next. Coming up, this Canadian couple has upsized in a big way. We owned a castle in France. How cool is that? From a Canadian household to a French chateau, their story is next in our moment. Stephen and Sarah Cole used to own a home in Fergus, Ontario. They sold during COVID and now they're the proud owners of an 11 bedroom chateau in France. The couple loves to travel and when they discovered their home had the same value as the French estate, they made the leap. So tonight, their international house swap is our moment. Welcome to the Chateau de Saint-Germain-de-Pré. So we decided to switch our four bedroom home in uh, Ontario for an 11 bedroom chateau in France. <laughs> the chateau itself dates from the 16th century. Basically the tower dates back 500 years and it blows my mind every time I run up there to my <laughs> sewing room. <laughs> yeah. It's 37 acres. It does take me about six hours to mow them. And of course we've got 13 fireplaces in the house now. So we yeah. do require some wood as well. We were able to sell our place in, in Canada and yeah, essentially buy this chateau for yeah. the same. This is the original part of the house. We really do feel for anybody trying to get into the market, but that seems to be where the market is right now. I guess what it comes down to is we saw an opportunity. We weren't running away from Canada. We love Canada very much, but the way we look at it throughout this entire experience that if it all fails, we owned a castle in France. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? And, you know, the opportunity to be able to say that was really the, you know, sort of a driving force to be able to go, let's let's try something different, you know, let's, let's go for it. Let's be those guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we love the lifestyle, we love the house, we love the people that we're getting to meet now. It's just been awesome. Well, it looks awesome. It's so beautiful. Imagine that life in a chateau in France. But all I could think, well, that's the first thing I thought. Second thing I thought is, how do you deal with the upkeep? The, the amount of work that's involved, the cost involved. Well, they've got that partially figured out. They're going to invite artists and other creatives to uh, go to the chateau and, and collaborate there, which brings to mind the Elton John album from the 70s, where they recorded an album at a French chateau. You can look it up if you don't know off the top of your head. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hedemansen. See you tomorrow night.